homage to the Buddha, homage to the Dharma, homage to the Sangha. Reverend Master G.U. Peggy Kennett learned the Buddhist precepts from Venerable Sadatissa of the London Buddhist Vihara in London, <clears throat> from Venerable Kim Seng in Malaysia, from Ko Zenji and from the various seniors in Japan and other monks who she encountered. In Japan, she learned to be, go beyond the conventional understanding of the precepts. If you refrain from killing, from stealing, from lying, from adultery, from drunkenness, you will achieve merit and have favorable rebirth. <clears throat> By favorable rebirth, I mean in this case, uh, fortunate rebirth, as many people understand it. This understanding of the precepts is, of course, common throughout the world and throughout history. Sometimes they're only practiced within the same tribal group or people. Sometimes they're practiced more widely. They are common to all religions and most philosophies. Master learned and Dogen teaches, as does Bodhidharma, that we must go beyond, convent beyond this, that it is not enough to simply create good karma and avoid bad karma. Doing so can go on endlessly. And the conventional understanding of this is not connected to liberation. It is the reason that Dogen says that the first precepts are the three refuges. We take refuge in the Buddha, the source of teaching about this. We take refuge in the Dharma, 
which teaches us to look beyond the conventional understanding. And we take refuge in the Sangha, those who, after the Buddha, have continued to teach and can teach us and instruct us. One of the reasons that what we call the Zen tradition, which is not a term that Dogen liked at all, but why we call it the Buddha mind or the Buddha essence, tradition or transmission is because like Shakyamuni Buddha, The aim is liberation. Frequently, too frequently, in books, they say nonsensical things such as the Buddha way was only intended for those renounce the world and become monastics. This is utter nonsense. Liberation depends upon the training efforts of the person concerned. I will speak more about that tomorrow. Dogen says the precepts are the very lifeblood of Buddha. And they become so when they are applied in the context of liberation. So in our practice, we do not just refrain from killing. We examine the, our own minds and intentions regarding anger. We come to understand, as I said in previous Dharma talk this week, we come to understand that the source of war and violence if is within people like ourselves. And therefore, it is within ourselves that the training regarding this has to be done, begun. This is how, therefore, we make use of the precepts and why Dogen and Bodhidharma, who wrote the short commentaries that we encounter regarding each precept, it is why they did it in that manner. Therefore, the first precept, do not kill. And the commentary says, for nothing in fact can be cut off.
This, of course, refers to a obvious truth that to kill something in order to destroy it and to remove it from our sphere, if that is the intention, does not actually work for to kill somebody or something actually increases the karmic connection with them and means that one is set in motion something between the two people which will eventually have to be cleansed. Each of the precepts have such a little commentary. Do not be angry. There is no coming, no going. There is a brilliant sea of clouds. There is a dignified sea of clouds. face of the dignified sea of clouds, anger becomes more than ridiculous. Almost filled with pathos. This way of understanding the precepts does not take a sophisticated mind or a college education or a certain level of wealth or a certain level of education or social position. This does not require massive learning, massive understanding, having read all the Tripitaka. It just starts off with us looking at ourselves In the beginning, may not, it may not be that we look with the same level of honesty as we would wish, or the same level of clarity we would wish, but do not worry about that. Buddha Dharma is many myriad skillful means to benefit beings. Extremely wide and also extremely deep. There is the story that when translations of Buddhist scriptures were being introduced into China, and sometimes they were coming like every day, new renditions of them arriving over the Silk Route or by the sea from India.
And in China, they eagerly awaited these translations and sutras from India. And one day there arrived a translation of the Parinirvana Sutra. And it was a version that taught things from a conventional understanding. Only those who train themselves can see beyond the conventional understanding and go beyond it. So the emperor, reading this particular version, saw that it said, and as I say, this is a kind of common sense view, that some beings just do not have the capacity to train. That some beings do not have the Buddha nature. And then, and as I say, this is a conventional understanding, obvious and understandable. particularly in regards to people who do great evil. So this version of the scripture was widely disseminated and taken up by people. But there was a Buddhist teacher, a Buddhist master, cultivated in practice and experience, who rejected the conventional, this conventional understanding, and said, actually, this is not so, even if the sutra says. Everything has the Buddha nature. And he taught this. This created a scandal. And he had to leave being head of the monastery and went into exile. It is said that he uh, said before he left that if he were right in regards to this, he would again teach on the Dharma seat of that temple. The story goes that he was exiled to a little temple in a remote area. And then having nobody to teach, because nobody wanted to learn from him, He would teach about all things having the Buddha nature. And that when he would say that, the very rocks would bow. You can still go to that area of China and see the bent over rocks. And eventually, another version of the Parinirvana Sutra came from the East that said, uh, all, all, everything has the Buddha nature. And so this monk was vindicated and returned to his monastery. I hope that you can see the problem, what the problem was. The problem was that people relied upon the text 
without practice, and that when the text contradicted, they threw the guy out. When the text was in agreement, they brought the guy back. One must be very careful of relying on text without practice. Remember that in particularly in some areas of the world, the interpretation of old texts has led to people killing one another. The Buddha Dharma is understood by the practice of the Buddha Dharma. The scriptures can help point us, but they are not a substitute for practice. They are not a substitute for realization. As we ordinarily come into this world, as I've said before, it is like, to some degree, being in a play where our parts have already been scripted by karma. Past karma tells us when we are born, it tells us who we will have as friends, who we will reject, what ideas we will gra uh, grasp after, what ideas we will push away. And, as with many people, we can go through our lives following this script. And live our lives in a play like actors being directed by the past karma. Or we can stand still and cease to participate in the play. The play of soap opera, the play of conspiracy theories, The play, as Dogen says, of rising and falling in society without our feet ever touching the ground. Or we can stop and see. We can cut the ties to that director and live real lives. The means of doing so are meditation, stop, stop, and for a moment, sit and be still. Sit and let go for a moment. Do not follow the plot of the play.
and the precepts. The precepts tell us how to cut the ties with the director of the play. The precepts teach us how to no longer live in a fantasy world like a play. As I said, when we enter this lifetime, we pursue what is called karmic life as I described. As through the practice of the precepts and the practice of meditation, we learn to cut through and let go of this karmic life. Then real life emerges. Karmic life is limited, although to people it seems without limit. It is limited in selfishness. It is limited in our inability or unwillingness to let go. As karmic life is overcome and fades, real life emerges. This was the point Reverend Master Ji was trying to get across in naming the book that she wrote, Zen is Eternal Life, which was the title of it when she composed it in Japan and the title of it when it was first published in Malaysia as a result of don donations from lay people. The first four chapters were published as Zen is Eternal Life. When we hear eternal life from the viewpoint of karmic life, we think that somehow we are going to last forever. But this is not what it's talking about at all. If we are able to emerge into real life, <clears throat> the life and flow of the Buddha mind, when karmic life is dropped, karmic life is the dropping off the coming to the end of karmic life is the dropping off of body and mind because body and mind are the product of karmic life. When real life emerges, it is not our personal property. It is the flow of the real Many people, completely foolishly, think that this talk of real life and the teaching of compassion is a foolish dream. But in fact, it is the hatred and greed that are the foolish dream.
when we emerge into real life and practice real life, then we participate in the flow of the Buddha mind, the flow of compassion. And out of compassion, wisdom arising. This is the going, going, going on beyond and always going on beyond. Always becoming Buddha. I wish that you may realize this. It is my sincere wish that you realize it. Homage to all the Buddhas in all worlds. Homage to all the Bodhisattvas in all worlds. Homage to the scripture of great wisdom. <laughs>